magical ferry to the Baltic island of Gotland. It is now Swedish, but it has formerly been under Danish and German control. It's very pretty, because in the Middle Ages it was a very wealthy place due to the trade of the Hanseatic League, and so the island is now covered in all kinds of beautiful medieval ruins and churches and abbeys. However, this video is about what happened long before that, in the pagan times of the Iron Age. Many people throughout hundreds of years of Swedish history have identified Gotland with the, the Goths, as they were called in Anglo-Saxon literature, the Glorious Goths. The Goths spoke what is nowadays regarded by linguists as one of the only Eastern Germanic languages. So that means that they broke off from the other Germanic language, Proto-Germanic language speakers at a time before North Germanic and West Germanic language groups emerged. So like modern Swedish is in the North Germanic group, English is in the West Germanic group. There are no living East Germanic languages, but the Goths spoke it. Now, a lot, it's quite a good case that Gotland was the original land of the Goths. Gudasaga tells the, about the origins of, Got, of Gothland or Gotland and it says that the Goths migrated from this island down into the Mediterranean, that it went, they went on a river through the, the Russia and down into Greece. And that's written in Old Norse, uh, of course. So they recognized that the Goths were a brother nation. And the same thing is in Anglo-Saxon literature. When, you talk, when we talk about um, the Anglo-Saxons are remembering that they came from the, you know, the Germanic milieu of, of, of Northern Europe. And they recognized that the Goths, who at that time were living in Spain, Italy, even North Africa, but they recognized that they were somehow a brother nation uh, because they had their common Germanic roots. Now, people in Sweden also recognized that, and they always thought that, that the Goths came from this island. Uh, and the name Gotland does seem to have an etymological relationship to the word Goth. And the, it's very interesting, the founding myth, although they, it's probably, you know, it's not historical, but it maybe has some basis in history, it tells the story of the first man on Gotland, and he was called Tjelvar. And this stone ship grave is called Tjelvar's grave. Uh, and he, this Tjelvar character is probably the same as the Old Norse Chalfi. Telfi is a, a figure, a servant of Thor in the Eddas. Um, so he's a mythical character. He's, he, he is a part of Norse mythology, but this, he was believed to have uh, been the founder of the, of the nation of the Goths. Um, what we know about this um, grave here, it's part of the same tradition as Ennant Herg, the stone ship there, which I showed in a video last summer. And it uh, obviously comes from this ancient Scandinavian ship cult that I've talked about in other videos. They're always quite near to water and the, the graves are made for prominent people. This is one of the best preserved ones in the world. All of them that exist are around the Baltic Sea really. So you have them in northern Germany, some parts of the um, Baltic states like on the western coasts and then along a lot in Sweden and southern Sweden and the, but the highest concentration I believe is here in Got Gotland and um, this is a beautiful example of one. Now, it says that the, late, the last ones were in the Viking Age, like the, but there were quite a lot during the Vendel era, which is the era just before the Viking Age. But this is one, a very old one. Uh, I believe this is from the late Bronze Age, the Nordic Bronze Age. And as I've mentioned in previous videos, the Nordic Bronze Age derives directly, comes straight out of the preceding um, battle axe culture, which is a variant part of the corded ware culture. Uh, so it's very, it's an Indo-European culture. However, there is no precedent for this ship, uh, stone ship culture in other Indo-European cultures anywhere in the world. So it does uh, reinforce my argument that the uh, Indo-Europeans uh, invaders, the corded ware culture who came into Scandinavia, did behave differently towards the natives uh, in Scandinavia when Indo-European invaders behave towards natives in other parts of the w uh, world that they invaded. Because not only do you have, for example, the I1 haplogroup, which is uh, a native European haplogroup, which was preserved here and is typical among Swedes, 
rather than the more typically Aryan happy groups R1A and R1B. But also you have customs like this that probably were the, the, the Indo-European interpretation of the pre-Indo-European culture uh, and the integration of um, these uh, later, a later date during the Viking era, the integration of these old structures into the Viking mythology and, and to the, the foundational myths of the, you know, the, um, the, the protogenesis of their race, of the Goths. They have to have these beautiful structures involved. And also, just as with the Anglo-Saxons, it's a good thing for Sweden at that time to associate themselves with the Goths because the Goths were a really, you know, major force in, in the whole world civilization. They were part of, you know, the, the, in the big cities of the south. So it, for a northern province like Sweden, it was, it was quite nice to think that those were their kinsmen. In fact, that's something that carried on in Sweden much, much, for a long, long time after the Viking Age. In, in fact, uh, historians even in the 16 and 1700s in Sweden like to imagine that the Goths were the founders of much of civilization and that they were really Swedes. Hail, hail, Sunna, light up the farthest shore. Hail, hail, His stone ships have shown that the people of Gotland were connected to the sea. The sea was important to them. But another important thing in Gotland history are the picture stones found all over the island. And what they show is that there was a solar cult here which continued from the Nordic Bronze Age right up until the Viking Age. This is a replica of a stone that was found in the field just behind here. It dates to the Iron Age, Germanic Iron Age. As you can see though, this symbol resembles a kind of Celtic uh, Triskelion, or, or some kind of variant of the swastika, but it's uh, certainly Germanic. Here also the shield of this warrior resembles a, a swastika. Uh, it could be presumed to have something to do with a solar cult, divided into four sections. May Perhaps each of these represent four parts of the year, seasons of the year. Um, these beasts at the top resemble what have been identified as horses in other similar stones so perhaps they are horses uh, and then two warriors at the bottom uh, who knows what the actual meaning of the stone was certainly it had some religious connotation uh, in the pagan religion of the uh, Germanic Iron Age but uh, one thing that's very interesting is that we know it was painted with bright colours the colours here are just uh, guesses because they don't know which colours but they were bright and it would have stood in this field for what reason we can only imagine. The earliest picture stones date to the uh, Iron Age not long after the Bronze Age and they seem to continue the tradition of the Bronze Age rock carvings that are found in Scandinavia because they also can they also depict boats uh, you can see the similarity between them this one, Fontanum, and uh, then also a similar ritual uh, boat is depicted here on a Gotland stone. But the main focus of all Gotland stones appears to be a solar symbol of some kind, a large disc with a shape in the center. It's thought that the stones themselves served as grave monuments, which explains their solar iconography because focusing on the eternal solar cycle does then in a way refer also to the cycles of life and death. Uh, especially when placed uh, as, as a grave marker. Uh, this argument is also supported by many images relating to death on the stones, including Sleipnir, who's Odin's horse, and Odin is the Lord of the Dead. There's uh, the sacrifice scene on one of them. There are battles, and uh, also there's the Valknut symbol, which is thought to be a symbol of the dead by some. The cremation graves are sometimes found at the foot of the stones as well, uh, and also sacrifices of animals. And all the stones have been found near Iron Age houses, and so they were probably raised by the people who live near to them. Uh, we also see the serpent is a recurring theme on the stones. Sometimes people interpret this as a phallic symbol, but I think that's a mistake because 
the serpent when coiled into a circle is really a symbol of the eternal cycles of time, just as the sun is. A stronger argument can be made that the stones themselves are phallic because many of them are carved into a phallic shape. And, but this too could actually be a nod toward the origin of human life and a poignant symbol to place at the end of a human life as a grave marker, thus putting the cycle of birth and death in context. There's a, an essay by Anders Andren from 2011 and that looks at the spiral whirl icons of the Iron Age group of stones and it interprets them, as I do, as being representation of the sun. It interprets the boats beneath them as being day ships which carry the sun across the sky. That's very interesting and I, I think that might also explain some of the earlier um, rock carvings in Sweden. And it also seems to tie in with the earlier Indo-European idea of a horse-drawn chariot pulling the sun, which we can see depicted in this Bronze Age model of a chariot from Denmark. Very Indo-European. There are many different things depicted on stones. I mean, warriors are an image that occurs on most of them. Uh, about 32% uh, of the stones have, a, have warriors of some kind depicted on them. But I mean, the, the main thing that you see on them are horses and the solar disk. And this is very Indo-European. These two very Indo-European symbols together show that the people in Gotland were continuing this Indo-European solar cult which was related to horses, but that they were integrating it with the Nordic boat cult, and that the boat was taking on some of the roles of a sacred horse-drawn chariot which had pulled the sun through the sky. The so-called Snake Witch Stone is unique. It features a Triskelion shape composed of three battle beasts, a boar, a bird, possibly a raven, and a serpent or a wolf, uncertain which one. The symbol resembles a swastika and is placed at the top of the stone like other solar symbols. Beneath it is an image of what has been interpreted as a witch or vulva holding two serpents. This may in fact be a variation on a very ancient motif uh, of a man between two beasts, and it actually resembles depictions of the baby Hercules. This beautiful place is Storahemus, and there used to be in this area four rune stones that are attical picture stones. Sometimes it, some of them depict boats. There's also a depiction of Odin and his eight-legged horse being presented with a horn of mead by a figure that may be a Valkyrie or some such figure. But um, they have all been moved to a local museum. Another interesting thing about these, this, one of the stones that was here is that it is thought to this be the only uh, visual depiction of the blood eagle, which is mentioned in one of the sagas, a, 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 an alleged form of ritual sacrifice um, practiced by the Vikings. Uh, it's unclear whether it really was a depiction of the blood eagle, but the stone that was here had a, uh, a man lying on his uh, lying on a, on a table or slab or some kind of altar, another man standing over him, and above the uh, Above them there is a Valknut, so-called Valknut, a modern term for a, a symbol which we have associated with Odin, although that connection is somewhat tenuous. Um, it's certainly some kind of magical symbol in Nordic paganism. And there's also a bird above them, presumably an eagle, which is a symbol of Odin. It's a, a, one of the animals that Odin tr turns into, he transforms into, in the stories of the Eddas. Uh, why would these stones be in this area? It may be that this area was a uh, sacred uh, to the pagans of Gotland, and it may indeed be that in this idyllic little meadow and in the surrounding forests there were brutal scenes of human sacrifice. Maybe not. All we have now are these sheep. This is a more typical Viking era style boat. Huge sail up here, and then a big warship with the shields on the outside. But here we have this symbol. Nowadays people call it the Valknut. Why is it up next to this man? We don't know. People want to associate it with Odin, but there's nothing in this image to indicate that anything is Odinic. The symbol can appear ab above supposed sacrifice scenes, or it can appear above totally unrelated things. 
if it's a symbol of the dead, there are no dead people in this image, so why would they have it here? It's hard to know what this symbol exactly means, but it clearly has some kind of religious significance. This stone is actually one of four which make up a tomb, and I think for that reason you can definitely say it is connected to death. What's more, the scene on this panel with the Valknut appears to depict a man sacrificing an animal, possibly a dog. If you think that this video was worthless, then you don't owe me anything. But if you enjoyed this video, then please pay me what you think it was worth. You can give me a one-time donation on PayPal, or you can set up recurring donations through Patreon and become one of my patrons. I really appreciate anyone who contributes towards my channel because it's what helps keep this going. Thank you very much.